good. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Next week, Kurt Kuttenberg from the National Weather Service in Green Bay will be here to talk about Wisconsin weather safety and you. And I always get to remind myself that tornadoes has an E in it, but derechos does not have an ES. Those are two of my favorite things to worry about. In two weeks, Aaron Ragsdale from Integrative Biology will be here to talk about a new model of human origins in Africa. This is work that uh, was published in Nature in, on the 13th of June. And so I'm really delighted to uh, have Aaron be able to come and talk about such great work. And then on the 6th of September, Sally, go ahead, speak, Sally. Specialist with uh, Cooperative Extension, as it was known at the time, at the Biotech Center. And Ken Smith is on the, uh, one of the three or four people who was on the selection committee. Blame Ken. <laughs> uh, and I've been here ever since. I had two visits to Washington, D.C. One is a Congressional Science Fellow for the House Committee on Agriculture in uh, 2000 and 2001, and then another um, as a speechwriter for the director of the National Science Foundation in 2008 to 2010. All right. So Wisconsin's land grant U at 175 outlooks for science outreach is what I'd like to talk with you about tonight. A little bit of storytelling, a little bit of listening. I'd like to hear what some of your ideas are on this. Um, I'd like to think about the functions of milestones. Uh, the last one we had was the sesquicentennial. That was 1998-1999. Uh, they can be really good. They can be touchstones where we think about what are we about, what have we been about, how are we evolving, what things are we going to leave behind, what things are we going to pick up, what things are we going to sustain. So they can also be millstones where they become self-congratulatory, but a millstone actually can be very useful. It is a wheel with an axle and you can make flour, which means, whoa, you can make bread. And um, a millstone is also akin to a potter's wheel, which has two wheels, which I think is pretty cool. It's probably the invention of the wheel, some archeologists will contend. So it's been 25 years since the UW sesquicentennial. That is a human generation, biologically. Holy cow, it's amazing. And uh, I was here seven years before that started, so I feel WOLD is my favorite AM radio station. <laughs> a lot has happened since 1998, and if you've been here all that time, it's hard to remember how much has transpired. Um, the other thing that's kind of weird is in 1998, the previous 25 years took us back to 1973. And what happens uh, over 25 years is that that previous 25 years comes more into focus. Um, and I think that's one of the helpful things about what we could do with this milestone at 175 is to also think about the last 50 years and not just the last 25 or 175. So this is uh, brief stuff from my previous talk. Um, I want to point out that sharing science with the public or sharing higher education with the public goes way back. Uh, it's traceable at least to Aristotle and the Lyceum, which provided public lectures every day. I think it's noteworthy that Plato's Academy did not provide public lectures, and yet we refer to ourselves as academicians instead of lyceums. Uh, another place that's notable for me, because I like their uh, online lectures, is Gresham College. If you've ever heard of Gresham's Law, uh, this is the same guy. Uh, when his will was executed in 1597, he set up this Gresham College, which provides pre public lectures in the liberal arts, plus divinity, and they were in English, which was a big deal at the time. Uh, you may have heard of the Royal Institution and the Christmas lectures. Uh, those also served as a model for Bassam Shakashiri's Christmas lectures here at UW-Madison that ran for 50 years. 
Uh, the Athenaeum movement, the Lyceum movement, the Chautauqua movement were all things happening in the 19th century when the university was getting up and running. There was also the Grange movement, founded right after the Civil War. Uh, Hort's Dairyman is an example of magazines that were geared to help educate and build community uh, within farmers and especially within dairy farmers here in Wisconsin in the Midwest. The farm short course is interesting because it was launched here at UW-Madison in 1886. We had very few people in the long course, very few as in none. And so for a long time, the major way that we fulfilled our land grant, our moral land grant, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, perhaps Morill is better, uh, obligations was through the farm short course. I like to say that UW-Madison is a two-time land-grant university. Uh, that's because most people know about the 1862 Morrill Agriculture College land-grant that was passed on, the, I think, the 3rd of July of 1862 or signed by Lincoln then, I can't remember which. But we also had one from the Northwest Ordinance way back in 1787 under the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. And this established the idea that one way that the federal government could speed education, especially higher education or including higher education, was to provide states coming into the union grants of federal land that could be either rented or sold and the proceeds would go into a perpetual fund. Wisconsin got one of those. We actually got another one because we screwed up our first one. And, uh, there are other universities that got these that aren't land grant, that aren't moral land grant universities. So uh, this is a big deal because uh, we also got the 18, in 1866, UW-Madison was, the University of Wisconsin as it was then, was designated by the legislature as the land, moral land grant. Uh, 1878, we weren't very big. Think how many people went to college at the time. And so that means all the people that weren't college educated were potential populations for lifelong learning. And how would you reach them? And why would you want to do that as a university? In 1883, the Ag Research Station started, which had a outreach function to it. The Hatch Act, the Federal Hatch Act, not the one that um, has to do with political malfeasance, but um, the one that's federal dollars for research every year, every year, every year, was in 1887, an auspicious year because Thomas Chamberlain came here uh, to be president. He's a geologist. He grew up in part in um, uh, Beloit, and I think he went to Beloit College, I'm not sure. Um, but he doesn't get as much credit as some of us think, and uh, Bill Barker and I and others think he ought to get more credit for the Wisconsin idea and shifting towards a public service mission in a clear way at this university. The person who gets a lot of credit for this is, of course, Charles Van Hees, and I think he ought to. This is from his February 15th, 1905 speech. At the Red Gym, he, the top is the ending phrase, which a lot of people know. I shall never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every family of the state. This is my ideal of a state university. If our beloved institution reaches this ideal, it will be the first perfect state university. He uses the word ideal twice, never uses the phrase Wisconsin idea, at least in this speech, and I don't know that he did or did not. But here's a cool thing that's cool also. This is the opening. It's a great pleasure upon behalf of the university to welcome the representatives of its owners, the members of the legislature and the press. The University of Wisconsin is a state and not a local institution. It is on the basis of that statement that when people come here and I ask them who owns the University of Wisconsin-Madison, system, I, if they don't say, I respond by saying the 5.9 million residents of Wisconsin.
right off the bat, it wasn't just about agriculture. So here's this uh, article about a political scientist professor here. And the National Science Foundation has funded political science. Um, and this is Ernst Meyer, and he's going to talk about how we can help cities help themselves. This is from 1910, otherwise known as a progressive era. And uh, this is in La Follette's Weekly, which is the same person that started, that served as governor and then as senator. Um, and notice that it was called the state, there's a newly created extension department of the state university's Municipal Reference Bureau. There's a legislative audit bureau. There's a legislative reference bureau. And those are words that La Follette used. And I would be very interested where this phrase of calling it the Municipal Reference Bureau came to. In preparing for this talk, this is the first time I'd ever run into this. But the key thing is the university said, wow, we're going to put together lots of different public outreach, public service, public engagement frames, not just cooperative extension, not just aggregate. Well, that was, this predates cooperative extension, so they couldn't have. And have a comprehensive extension bureau. This to help cities organize. I would like to know what happened to that, and I will look into it. Well, the times they are changing, as the Nobel laureate saying. Um, the percentage of, well, think how many people in 1910 were going to high school. My grandparents were born in 1898. Of the four of them, one graduated from high school. One dropped out of school at the age of 13. I don't know how far the other two got. But it was routine and OK not to go through lots and lots of public education if you were born during the Spanish-American War, as my grandparents were. Well, that means you have a really big percentage of the population that might like to have some lifelong learning from their public land grant research and extension university. How are we doing today? This thing in Forbes says 53.7% of the country has some sort of higher education uh, degree certificate or um, other accolade that they're going to count as higher education. The Census Bureau says 37.8% of us in 2021 had college degrees, bachelors. Whoa. You would think all our problems would be solved if education was the elixir and the fixture that on occasion people think it is. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and yet we still have plenty of work to do as the last three years and seven months have illustrated. So I'd like you to take a moment and please come up with three or four sources at UW-Madison of Science Outreach. Beyond the ones that I mentioned, just think about if you were coming from like my cousins who live in Racine or my friends who live in Hayward or folks over at Platteville, where would you come to at your public land grant research university for science outreach? It will take a long, long time to get through it all, which is a blessing and astonishing. But it's also hard, it also points out that one of the things that we might want to do is do a better job of pulling all this together. A library is not just a collection of books. A library is a curated, cataloged collection of books. And I think we might want to help the 5.9 million people who are our co-owners make it easier to navigate. So here's some things from my previous talk. Continuing studies, extension, public broadcasting, communications, college and school resources. Of the 13 schools, I think all, almost all of them publish a magazine or certainly online. The Office of Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education, which is where the Biotech Center is in, as well as 18 other centers, which are juggernauts in science outreach. And we often don't think about them that way, but we could and we should. And we should project it that way. 
but lo and behold, of the three missions in the name of the Office of Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education, only two get mentioned. Um, there's communication offices, as I mentioned, with magazines, websites, and social media. Two of those are within 1995 till now. So 29 years at most. Campus and visitor relations, which up until recently had, um, had a field trip function that greatly helped myself and my colleagues orchestrate complex field trips to campus. Uh, they're no longer doing that, and so we just had a 90-minute meeting today uh, organized over at the Discovery Building to try to figure out what we might be able to do to help with that. And then things like Badger Talks, which I'll talk about more. Here's one of the earliest examples of widespread going, not just bringing, excuse me, not just welcoming people to campus, but ex having campus resources spangled across the state in a constellation of research and extension facilities. This is the Ag Research Stations, part of the Agriculture Experiment Station. What you don't see on here is an Agriculture Research Station in the southeast. Not in Washington, not in Waukesha, not in Milwaukee, not in Racine, not in Kenosha. And that is a huge slice of our population. And I often think how nice it would have been had somebody like J.C. Walker, who was from Racine, one of the founders of plant, uh, 20th century plant pathology, if we'd had the foresight to build a research station there. Facilities matter, and no facility matters more than places. And you can see the other folks. What you don't see on that one is, over the last 25 years, the one that used to be in Ashland is closed. So things come and things go. And again, this is the time, one of the things about having milestones is to ask what's not on this map that used to be on this map. 25 years ago, extension was not part of UW-Madison. It's cooperative extension, but it was part of UW-Extension, which was its own university with its own chancellor. On October 17th of, 19, of 2017, it was a Wednesday, and I was standing right over there, if I remember right, when I saw the news come through that the UW system president at the time announced that he was going to close down extension and bring Wisconsin Public Broadcasting and Cooperative Extension back to UW-Madison, whence they came in 1965. That was a very big deal because now, when you think about how do people access the resources of their public land grant research and extension university, Wisconsin is back among the other 49 states where their extension is um, their agriculture, 4-H, I call it family living, um, community natural resources, these are the old names because those are the ones I remember, um, are back as part of the university. So there used to be blue and white signs that said UW-Extension in front of these offices and starting about five years ago, big crest W with red and white and black and that's a big deal. Uh, earlier this year, after my talk in January, you can see this, have, this was announced on February 10th. Uh, it was announced that the extension, the division of extension, which is going to be moved out of its place on Lake Street so that they can tear down the Lake Street building so they can expand the um, music building. Originally, they were all planned and they worked for a year and a half or more on plans to move into the computer science building, which put a smile on my face, and you know how hard it is to put a smile on my face. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is going to be great. At long last, since 1961 or two, whenever they moved from next door to Ag Hall, Extension was going to be back in the central part of campus with a lot of other science-y people. And then this came. Now they will have 300 parking spaces. They'll be more than a mile and a half from campus. <laughs> This is, uh, well, there are people that see advantages to this. 
I also want to point out that um, we've had a school of medicine since 1909. However, it was they called it themselves, they called it the Attic Medical School uh, because they didn't have a hospital and they could only do two years of the four that they needed. And it wasn't until after World War I, when they're, well, the Great War, um, when the state hospital, which is right next door to us, was put up and started up in 1924, I think, that the medical school could go to four years. And I think our first medical doctor from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, UW as it was at the time, didn't graduate till 1927. Look at how, many, how vital this is, however, to dots on the map and being able to say, what's the University of Wisconsin-Madison doing for me, at least in health? And health is more than science, but most health outreach is also science outreach. Would that be all right, Walt, to say? Good. Okay, and this, I had to blow this up so that you get a better idea of what it looks like. These are all the different types of things from this map um, that they are pointing out. And that's the map again. The Data Digest is a great, great thing. Um, a new one comes out about every April. Um, this is what happens when you stack ball bearings very carefully. The uh, thing about this is here's our 2023 fast facts. 13 schools and colleges, we've been doing that a long, long time. How big are we? About 35,000 undergrads. Total number of students, just shy of 50,000. 10,000 degrees a year. Total living alumni, 476,000. I don't know what percentage lives in Wisconsin, but it's a big one. Let's say it's half, and then still get you. Uh, 230,000 people. Look what they include now. Undergrad, retention, applicants. Ooh, there's all kinds of stuff on undergraduate stuff. Then we get down there to NSF expenditures. We are a juggernaut. 1.38 billion dollars a year in research and development. That places us only eighth in the country. We used to be second. So that is a huge amount of research being done that often needs to be shared with the public. And look at the state appropriations because I'm gonna show you the one from 25, 26 years ago. Number of faculty, 2,392. Inventory of land acres, it's not gonna change much. Okay, and then we have these things called websites. This is from 97, 98. They've been doing this for 27 years. Okay. Total number of living alumni, 315,000. 40,000 students instead of 50. Degrees awarded, 8,500, 10,000 last year. Sponsored funding awarded, just shy of half a billion. We're at 1.3 billion now. That 47.2, I think, is when we were second or third nationally. 2,059 faculty. The acres are about the same, if I remember right. Okay, so here we are. This is to go back so you can see that there were no websites then. As a reminder that in 1997-98, it was in its, by today's standards, infancy. That means for mass media, what did we have? TV radio, magazines, what's that? Newspapers. newspapers, yes, print, yeah. 
All this has been in the last 27, 28, 29 years. Okay. This is an organizational chart. This is, uh, I just got it today. It's from uh, September of 2022. This is off the website of the university. And the cool thing is, here's the chief academic officer. No. Here's the chief academic officer. Here's the chief research officer, vice chancellor for research and graduate education. Student affairs, university relations, all these things. And if you ask yourself who is the chief operating officer for the third mission, you will not get this straightforward answer because I don't think we have one. Other universities do, Penn State, Michigan State, Minnesota. Many of those, if not all of them, are peer institutions. Uh, we have, the university has chosen not to have a vice chancellor for engagement. Um, we do have a vice chancellor for university relations, which does a lot of great work. And the new chancellor also instituted recently a new vice chancellor position for strategic communication. And I can't remember if this person has started yet or uh, was just chosen. Um, but we will now have two vice chancellors, one for strategic communications and the other for university communications and marketing. So um, that's an area that I think we ought to think about. How do we project that constellation of resources that we have, make it easier for people to navigate it and understand it and access it? So by way of transition, here's a, another constellation. This is Universe in the Park. So this is another uh, example of something that's happened over the last 25 years. Uh, a little bit more than 25, but um, these are state parks that the astronomy department has gone and collaborated with the state parks and provided public outreach using telescopes so people can see the moon, the planets, the stars, and get a better grip on their place in the universe. The person who uh, helped start that, I believe, or help continue it, if I'm not wrong, is the dean of the College of Letters and Science. That's not a bad thing to have a dean who knows and who walks the talk of public engagement, especially in the dean's office in the South Hall. Uh, my friend Bruce Johnson, who many of you may remember, used to be the uh, camera operator for PBS and was here often, sent me this one when I asked folks for suggestions. He said, don't forget Science on Tap. There was one here in Madison. I don't know that it's revived since COVID. Science on Tap is firing up in October in Minocqua. This is You can see the people on the bottom, including Kemp Natural Resources Station, uh, Trout Lake Station, those are UW-Madison folks in the Alumni Association. So this is a place that, unlike here, we don't provide beer, but they do. <laughs> I think we should think about the model. <laughs> yes, but um, I also read that they are starting up in October of this year. I don't remember. Uh, which place. I might be wrong. I have vast experience at being wrong. <laughs> um, this is Badger Talks, which is very interesting. The saga of the Speakers Bureau function at the University of Wisconsin. Um, when I arrived here, we had a Speakers Bureau, and then it kind of went into hiatus, and then they put the money into a Wisconsin Idea database so that people could find things online. And if you just heard me argue that, wow, we ought to do a better job of providing stuff, that was one approach to doing it, but then we didn't have a Speakers Bureau. So the Speakers Bureau is back. It's called Badger Talks. It's part of uh, UW Connects. And um, this is a person from the Healthy Minds um, 
program here at the School of Medicine and Public Health given a talk. And I participate in Badger Talks. I think I have my little Badger Talks shirt on. <laughs> and it's an impressive thing. All over the state, they will, if you invite the, somebody from UW-Madison, if you can, they'll match you up and they will pay the mileage uh, for the person to go and come back. Next door is with science, um, but that started as the Center for Biology Education back in 1988 and 89. They pioneered the idea of changing names because it's biology, and that's what we call nomenclatural evolution. Uh, the name changes reflect changes in mission and scope, so that then it became the Institute for Biology Education, Institute for Cross College Biology Education, Institute for Biology Education, then with Science. Um, and so there are folks next door. When it started, it had a um, major part of, excuse me, a major function in public outreach. I think that's diminished relative to what it was when it started. Um, I mentioned how good it was to have a dean of the College of Letters and Science be a very effective outreacher. These are the weather guys. Uh, both of them have given several talks here. So Steve Ackerman on the left and Jonathan Martin on the right. And Jonathan eventually became department chair of the Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences. Uh, no, that's the name of the building. Anyway, the, the department that's in that building. And Steve Ackerman just announced that after uh, more than a decade as vice chancellor for research and graduate education that he's retiring. So it's a pretty great thing. We have been through a, a Camelot era here. I hope that will continue, but we have had people in very high places who were practicing science outreachers and knew the drill and walked the talk. And they're pretty good at being able to not only put their column in the papers and online, but they are on Larry Mueller once a month. Um, you can listen to their archives. And these things were not possible 25 years ago. The radio was, but the archive wasn't. Speaking of Larry Mueller, I will mention him again, along with Phil Pelletieri. Um, these are names for many of us who have been here for a while. Oh, wow, yeah. For folks new to Wisconsin, that's going to be like, you know, who's Bart Starr? This was on the uh, PBS Wisconsin, excuse me, Wisconsin Public Radio uh, thing today at 625. This goes back to the idea of keeping in mind that we have a very different relationship today than we did 25 years ago with the First Nations. Um, here are the First Nations with, um, from a particular map that is part of a book written by a scholar who's of First Nation extraction at Columbia University. And he's got a very interesting argument to make. The key thing for us, for me, talking about a land grant, it's one thing to say, oh, we got federal lands. And then you want to ask, where did the federal government get those from? And it wasn't from the Norwegians or the Swedes. Um, and I think that's always going to be something to keep in mind. Where does wealth come from? Who controls it? Who disperses it? who benefits and who loses. Public radio is a big deal to me because uh, one of the first public, one of the first radio stations in the nation, and we've had at least two talks from this lectern on that, um, was what became Wisconsin Public Radio. And I think this is a huge point of pride that the physics department was such a pioneer in this and that almost immediately once radio went from Morse code to also being by voice, um, that one of the major things was education and information for farmers, for teachers, for students. Um, uh, Gordon Commons is named for Pop Gordon, who taught music classes all over the state by radio. 
And here's a whole bunch of uh, things that they do today. I want to point out Larry Mueller, because not only did he give a talk once here long ago, um, but he's been around longer than You, it's astonishing. And I think only one other person has, one or two other people has sat in his chair the whole time. Do you know, Ken? You, okay. Um, the, whoever sits in this chair stays here a long, long time. Today, uh, at 11, 10 or so, I was in a car driving around and I happened to have this on. And who comes on but Phil Pelletieri? And Larry says to Phil, how long have you been coming here? And Phil, who's an entomologist, goes, I think you and I have been doing this for about 45 years. <coughs> That's a milestone that we ought to think about and be lucky that we have it. And this is, you can see Phil's name in tiny little letters there. Um, he, luckily, he, was, he retired in, in 2014 and P.J. Leash um, followed him, and P.J.'s gave him, given a couple of talks here also, and P.J.'s unbelievably outstanding. Oh, now there's the public television. So you may not think of Frederica Freiburg as a science outreacher, um, but as a source of science-y stuff, wow. There's AI, which is not artificial insemination as I thought it was, no, it's artificial intelligence. And that picture is cut off in part because this is a manufactured photo. And then where did all the mosquitoes go? So um, don't underestimate that. Uh, and then I'm pleased that PBS Wisconsin, when they went digital back in 2007, said, wow, we're going to be able to have something that we haven't had before, and that's a Wisconsin channel. They now have, I think, five total channels. And this is University Place. And they're the folks that, when they come to record here, that's, they're the, that's the crew from University Place. And they do more than Wednesday night at the lab, as you can see. But it has been manna from heaven. I don't know if Ken remembers or not, but Ken was on the selection committee. And when I interviewed um, over in the Enzyme Institute, in January of 1991, one of the questions was, gee, if you could do something, what would you do that's really a stretch? And I, uh, I think my answer was, well, you know, when I came to UW-Platteville in 1975, I could watch on Wisconsin Public Television, WHA, I could watch the Badgers play f football, the Badgers play basketball and the Badgers play hockey. I had no idea that there was a major research university there. Wouldn't it be nice if kind of coverage for athletics might also extend to science? And with the digitization, that happened. Of course, there was also this thing called the Big Ten Network, so all the athletics are not on public television anymore. Water is a big idea in a state like Wisconsin that has well over 300 lakes. Okay. And we have a lot of resources here. This is the uh, picture of the Center for Limnology. It's on Lake Mendota. It goes back to Edward A. Burge in the 1880s. It's considered the most highly studied lake in North America. It's one of the cradles of limnology. And if you would like to have a controversy, let's talk about water. Because land is one thing. But land without water. And not only do they have the wonderful building here on the bonny shores of Lake Michigan, they've got <laughs> Lake Michigan, Lake Mendota. They've also got the Trout Lake Station up by Boulder Junction. And they do a lot of great outreach in many ways, personally, but also through their publications. And you can see they've got a YouTube, they've got Twitter, they've got all kinds of things that are involved that. We also have a little Aquatic Sciences Center, which includes uh, um, the Sea Grant. 
And the sea grant is a play on words of land grant. Um, sea grant did not sell the seeds and give money to the universities, but both sea grant and space grant are federal funds that echo the land grant mindset. We are going to give you federal money to universities to do research and education and public outreach. There's also the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, which is part of the Division of Extension. And they're doing stuff all over the state and in part all over the world, um, but mostly here in Wisconsin. And you can see right away how important water is. They specifically call out hydrology, water resources as part of Wisconsin geology. Um, if there's something more controversial than water, water use, water rights, if you want to get people's hackles up, talk about water. That's one reason why I've had so many speakers here over the years on water. The Arboretum is a National Historic Landmark as of January of 2021 for its role in the um, ecology restoration movement. And one of the great things about living within biking distance of the Arboretum is that I can bike there. And they are doing the unsurpassed work on this campus in citizen science. And they just um, put out a um, position vacancy listing for somebody to lead their citizen science. And here are some of the citizen science that's going to be happening. 25 years ago, if you were to talk about citizen science, I think you would have got birding. I'm trying to think maybe some water stuff, water monitoring. And these are things now that um, people anywhere in Wisconsin can participate in um, as citizen scientists. I think it's a big part of the coming uh, decades for science outreach. Here's Great Lakes Bioenergy, which is um, a joint project between UW-Madison, which is the lead, and their lead partner is Michigan State University. And they do amazing work at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. This building is from 2010, 2011. I can't believe it's already a decade old. Um, this reminds us how important facilities are. Science Hall burning down in 1884 reminds us. Washburn Observatory being built in 1879 reminds us. This building with uh, outreach in this auditorium reminds us. It's really hard to do great science outreach without great facilities. And they do some amazing work there in science outreach. And I included this with more text here um, because they emphasize their role in research education and outreach, which are the three canonical missions of a land-grant university, including this one. So when you go to their website and you pull down on education, you see all the different things that they're doing. Astronomy, I just mentioned the Washburn Observatory. I really want to express my gratitude to astronomy. and uh, I've already, I think I mentioned physics, but I'll talk more about them. Just what an amazing set of resources that they have for outreach. Here's their calendar for outreach and space place and the Washburn Observatory and Universe in the Park and Planet Trek, and the Radio Astronomy Archives. This is for something that's, you know, like, wow. But these have, astronomy asks really basic questions about cosmology from the philosophy point of view. So here's uh, what's happening. They're on tonight at 9 o'clock, and University in the Park at the Rosha Cree State Park. That's the 16th and the 20th. 
They also have had space place, and in the last 25 years, since 1998, space place has migrated from the old, uh, I think it was an old Arby's on South Park Street. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I screwed up my franchise. Um, there's an Arby's next door to it, though. It's still there. <laughs> Dang. Um, and they moved into the Villager Mall, which at the time was called the Villager Mall, and now it's called the Village on Park. And they're in the basement there. Uh, their neighbor is the Wisconsin Science Museum. And the amount of work that the astronomy department does between the stuff they do that I just mentioned at Space Place and then with the Washburn Observatory is laudable, unbelievable. Jim Lattice tells me he thinks that whole idea of public observing goes back to the early 1880s. That means researchers were giving up research time. The Geology Museum is even older than Washburn. And what's cool about, one, one of the things that's cool about the um, Geology Museum is not only is it open six days a week and that it's free, and it's got cool dinosaurs as well as all these great mineral and other displays, is it goes back to the first Board of Regents meeting. That's old. So they had a collection starting very early on, and it was in Science Hall, which went up in 1884, up in flames. Uh, I can't remember when it was built, uh, oh, it says right there, 1877. And in 1884, it burnt down. To me, this is still a critical loss in the university because we had a comprehensive scientific collection at the time. And when that collection was rebuilt, it was only for geology. And we have never had a comprehensive science museum on this campus since. And some of, not all of, but some of our peer institutions do. And those kinds of museums can become places that people come to day after day. As Ken would say, it's part of making the campus a destination for exploration every day in an organized way. And we do not have that. We have a series of boutique science museums, and that's great, but it would be even more splendid if we had a building. And since we're talking about the future, hey, why not? Now physics. I've already mentioned physics when it came to radio, but they also have the oldest hands-on science museum in North America that I know of, and that's the Ingersoll, 1918. Open every day. It's, I don't think it's open on Saturday, but you can go in there and it's free, and they've got people that are going to help you. Now, the other thing about this is Think what it means to be an undergrad here and have an opportunity to develop your outreach chops. There's the Wonders of Physics, which is the road show, as well as the um, annual presentation that uh, Clint Sprott uh, has run for well over 30 years. We now have the Wonders of Quantum Physics, but I'm not sure about it. Thank you. We've had ice, cream, ice cube and neutrinos. When I arrived here in 1991, Ken was talking to me about Amanda. And it's like, yeah, they're drilling holes in ice mile deep at the South Pole. <laughs> wow, what for? <laughs> so this is an amazing thing um, that this university has, the people that work at this university have led um, and they do fantastic outreach. Uh, on November 6th of 1998, Jamie Thompson stood at this lectern to announce to the world that he'd figure out how to grow human embryonic stem cells. Three years before then, he had hired Jordana Lennon to do his, lead his communication and outreach program. And the stem cell learning lab is something that a Baldwin grant helped fund. And Jordana and Liz, Jesse and I still partner on that. And 
people come to our outreach lab to learn about stem cells um, in a hands-on way. The Institute for Chemical Education has long had a program at the chemistry department, um, but with some retirements recently, it is, uh, I think it's, I'm going to use the word, it's on hiatus. Um, and I hope that uh, that can be revved up again. Uh, John Moore is a professor who ran that, and he retired, as well as his wife, Elizabeth Moore. Andrew Greenberg, who's mentioned there, is working with uh, MRSEC, and I'll show you a picture of him. So the chemistry outreach has sh shifted over to the College of Engineering. I mentioned Bassam Shakashuri earlier, 50 years of doing uh, Once Upon a Christmas in the Lab. Oh, anyway, his Christmas show. Um, which is still one of the most popular things on public television, at least Bruce Johnson tells me it is. Um, and so a lot of people uh, cut their teeth on how to share science by watching the SAM in action. Uh, here's the Bursak thing that I was talking with you about. Um, Ann Lynn Jillian Daniel leads that. Um, but Andrew Greenberg is uh, one of the people that does that. Uh, everyone participates. So this is really a clear statement that grad students, postdocs, staff, faculty get to do the hands-on if they want. And that is a huge opportunity. I mentioned the ag research stations before. I just wanted to circle back to them because there's some of the oldest, and this is a prettier picture. You can see the 12 places mentioned there. And there they are on the map. This is an old map, since we're doing old things. It shows the one up in Ashland. Now I want to talk about three huge sources in the last 25 years of money for outreach. First was the Riley Baldwin Wisconsin Idea Endowment was a gift of $21.7 million back in 2001. And you can go read about it more at that place. But that was huge because it was specifically for the outreach mission of the university. Not specifically for science, but many of them are science. Wednesday Night at the Lab was a Baldwin winner in 2000 and into 2006. Um, so when Sarah Shute and I started this, it was a no small part because we got funding from this endowment. And this is a picture uh, from before October 2007, back when we met in the conference room. And we moved into this room when PBS Wisconsin asked, can we record these? It was much easier for them to record here than next door. Engineering Expo is one of the longest running public events on campus. The, undergrad, the undergrads organize this, two days. Used to be every other year, now it's every year. I want to give them big chops for doing that every year. What's that? Doubling. Yeah. Uh, the next one that I want to talk about besides the Baldwin, um, I'm sorry, the Engineering Expo is appropriately in there, but uh, out of place. The next big funding is the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the School of Medicine and Public Health, and I believe at the time it was the, just the School of Medicine, and this helped drive the name change from Wisconsin Medical School to the Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. So in the uh, late 1990s, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Wisconsin was thinking about, well, we're going to go from being a nonprofit to a profit. If that's the case, we're going to convert um, and make a big donation to somebody. And the two somebodies were Medical College of Wisconsin um, and UW School of Medicine. So this is the partnership program here, 2004, 19 years ago already. 
And here's the uh, Wisconsin Blues conversion. The blues were Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, this is written in 2007. It appeared in the Wisconsin Medical Journal. It's the journal of the uh, State Medical Society. And this is a critique of how some of the things panned out. And I think this is another time where it's important to remember if we're going to remember. Uh, I like things that are more commemorations rather than celebrations, because if it's only celebration, then you kind of elide over these things. And I think we need to continue to wrestle with some of the tougher stuff with this. So, wow, we're going to get as much as $250 million in May of 1999 value out of that, and we will split that for the two medical schools. That's May of 1999. $600 million by the time it cashed out. That means about $300 million. And I don't want to quote Senator Dirksen too often, but a million here and a million there, pretty soon you're talking real money. I think he said a billion, but yeah, that's all right. That was to keep people awake. So that's a huge, huge deal. So Baldwin was on the order of 21 million. This is on the order of 300 million. And so I think we'll want to look into stuff about how this is working. Now, how it worked, how the, this came about. And then the third gift was uh, the $50 million uh, from the mortgages that helped get the building across the street, the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery building, now called Discovery um, Away, on, on its way. And... Uh, I th this is also the building that has the town center in it. So it's the Discovery Building. It's a condominium, which is unusual. Um, the, you know, the state owns the western 30% and Wharf owns the 70% east, but the Wharf um, collaborates with the, the, the public Wisconsin Institute for Discovery on the town center. Um, but they collaborate on a vote of 30 to 70. And so it's basically operated by, uh, as Wharf would like it to be done. So here's uh, some of the aspects of this. The town center is the biggest part, from my point of view, as an outreach place in the Discovery Building. Um, and the two institutions. And this the two funders, the lead funders, I should say. Um, but as I mentioned, this is the only building I know of that's a condominium. Meat, and animal, meat Science and Animal Biologics building was a really big deal for me because so much of 4-H is still animal biology, animal projects, and that's a great thing. And oh my goodness, since this building opened two years ago, that's a splendid facility. They walk the talk, plus they have a butcher shop now that you can go to five days a week. And I do. Um, and I want to specifically call out that because, again, facilities matter. Here are some things in the humanities many of whom have given talks here, excuse me. Um, but I think this is where the crosstalk at a large university like this is really great. Ken, do you recognize the woman on the right in the blue dress? Okay. I'm not sure, but I think it might be Jane Wojcik, who was also on the committee that hired me. Um, this is an amazing thing. It's part of the digital humanities movement in the last few years, and it's the kind of thing that can happen at a large university. Another thing, that, and we had at least two, if not three, talks on Dictionary of American Regional English, and uh, linguistics is one of these things like anthropology. It's crosstalk between the humanities and sciences. I think this is a gem of accomplishment 
from the University of Wisconsin Madison. As is this history of cartography project, um, which is also about to wrap up. And here's something in the last 10 years or so, and this is called the city lab, or excuse me, the field day lab. And I envy the talent of the folks that do this. They are able to make games um, based on science exploration so that kids of a particular age um, will play these games and experience science. This one is a partnership with PBS Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Sea Grant. Joe Wilder and the Capital Case is again a partnership between PBS Wisconsin and archivists at the Wisconsin Historical Society. I think they're working on one for the canoe, the wood canoes, but I'm not sure. And I love this message. When it comes to sharing your work with the public, the stakes are higher than ever. We'll turn your research into a fun, academically rigorous game that reaches hundreds of thousands of people. Team up with us and become an outreach superstar. Um, if people are thinking about when they're deciding where they want to go for their university, whether to attend or to be on the staff or faculty, that kind of message can be influential. Uh, another outreach achievement is the uh, Tiny Earth that Joe Handelsman started and is in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery across the street. And their approach is to train people how to look for bacteria that make antibiotics. And they've got a focus on inspiration and addressing the dwindling supply of antibiotics and protecting our soils. And here's some of the numbers that they tote up. These are large. Five letters, I am NVS. And finally, the life cycle of fast plants. When I came here in 1982, there was a guy in the hallway, I think it was on the sixth floor, might have been the fifth floor, and there were just plant carts everywhere, and there's these little bitty plants. And that was Paul Williams when he was growing cabbage. Now you know cabbage is something the size of my head, and it's a biennial, and it takes two years to go through its life cycle, and if you are a plant breeder, that's a little long. So he developed rapid cycling brassicas to speed his own research. Then he had the great idea to go, wow, these could be a model organism. So he took his research tool and applied his astonishing intelligence and diligence over 20 years to develop these into uh, Wisconsin fast plants. And he got, uh, I think he worked with Wharf to not, if not patent the plants at least to copyright and trademark Wisconsin fast plants. I'm, if I'm wrong on that, I will have to correct. Um, and you can see this is through all these different ages of learners, including independent studies for people of all ages. And they've been all over the world and up on the space station. So this is what he was shooting for. We want to go for speed, productivity of seed, small and easy to grow. Small, fast, simple, and cheap. It is a great thing to bequeath to humanity a new model organism. Uh, and I just want to point out he's been here since 1962. As a faculty member, I think he came in 59 or 60 as a postdoc. And it was British Columbia's loss and our great gain. And that's Paul. So one of the things I mentioned was what's coming for science field trips. And this is a bigger theme about access. We do a great job of synergizing at this university, but synergy still takes money, time, and people. And with the um, loss of the service of the um, campus visitor center on helping us organize multi-site 
field trips, a group of 10, 12 outreachers are putting their heads together to figure out what they can do. Um, but they already realize this is going to be a lot of work and a lot of time. They're willing to put in that extra work and time to orchestrate this to make it possible. That said, every minute, every hour spent on organizing is a minute or an hour not preparing and actually leading. And so this is no small endeavor, no small enterprise that they're engaging in. And with that, I'd like to stop because it's already late and take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Is access to is access to the libraries. That is uh, so much because uh, students have access to the digital side of the libraries, and that's not something that uh, the university seems to be supplying to the general public. Would you comment on that if that's the case? It's an oversight on my part that I didn't include the University of Wisconsin Madison library system. To the extent that they can, and it's very expensive, you have to pay for licenses um, for the things that you do. But they are really committed to the idea of their public service mission. And uh, I probably should add something about that. So I, I admire what they do, and their heart's in the right place. My first job was working at a public library, and nobody has more spine in the right places than the people that work at publicly owned libraries. Yeah, going back to the first few slides, uh, you mentioned this municipal reference bureau. Um, I believe that Milwaukee has a municipal reference library, so that might be one place to uh, to start looking as far as determining uh, what the status is of the concept of a municipal reference bureau. I'll look into that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, it is one of the fun things about just stumbling on things. They're like, whoa, look at that. Um, and I'm hoping I get to figure out more about where that, how that or originated and what became of it. You're focusing on the last 25 years, but I haven't seen Jim Feldman in a while, but he gave a talk on the history of University of Wisconsin buildings, and I don't remember about outreach of the buildings, uh, but that I wonder if you remember uh, going back to his talk on UW buildings, if he mentioned any outreach. Um, Jim Feldman's book, The Buildings of the University of Wisconsin, is a gem. And I have a copy of it, and it is well, well read and well worn. Um, this building, which opened in 1995, is the last entry in that book. And that means that if you want to find out the stories of all these wonderful buildings that have gone up since 1995, that awaits. Because we need a storyteller to collect and compile and write those stories. Um, you can find some of the data on buildings when you go to the map.wisc.edu, which is another thing that's a huge advance, as well as, as I mentioned in my talk earlier this year. Um, but uh, I don't know that Jim specifically calls out outreach, but he certainly covers all the buildings, including things like the Stock Pavilion um, that, and the Dairy Barn that were built in part for public exhibition. Uh, he does a great job with Wisconsin Center, now the Pyle Center, and uh, that's from 19... mid-1950s is the best I can remember. Other questions? So what else am I missing in addition to the library system? Ken? When you were doing the data set near the beginning, 
This is a macro question. Wisconsin has a gross domestic product, okay? What's the relationship over time between the gross domestic product of Wisconsin and state funding for the university? I'll bet it's going down. Um, well, let's go over to the library and look it up. <laughs> um, I don't know, and I think one of the things that we're always looking at is our com not only our peer institutions as a university, but the states that we see as our competitors. I think it's fair to say Minnesota is the primary one that um, we're competing with and that we project as competing with. And all I can say is four is the number of Super Bowls that the Vikings have lost. <laughs> Zero is the number they have won. Okay. I'll just reverse an example. When I was a new faculty, I had the opportunity to go on something called the Wisconsin Idea Tour, which is now the Wisconsin Idea Seminar. And the notion there was to take new people, particularly those from outside the state joining faculty and staff, and take them around the state to show them what the state was really all about and where were those boundaries that we were supposed to be impacting, and it has stuck with me today. Right. So it's a reverse of the kind of idea you're taking here. It's to remind faculty what else is out there that they can interact with. Yes, and that's one of the key, I won't say our public service mission is unique, um, but there is no Illinois idea. And I'm from Illinois, and I went to the University of Illinois. And they do outreach, and they've got extension and all these things. But there is something, I'll say, extraordinary about this phrase and the commitment here to public engagement. And I think we always have to be looking at how can we learn from other institutions and other states. We did not invent public outreach. Uh, it's not yet perfected here or anywhere, so, but that it used to be in a school bus, and I'm guessing it's on a coach now, um, to be able, the plant pathology folks did a similar thing in a yellow school bus during the summer, and we went around the state to different locations, um, and as in your case, you remember that, I remember mine in the summer of 90, excuse me, 1982, and it's an extraordinary experience. Yes. Well, thanks for that, Tom. Hey, I was just kind of want to do a comparison here from last week with Amy Rosenbaugh with uh, Wisconsin's Lost Coastal Communities along Lake Michigan. And that was like all the roughly the same time the university was being set up as well, right, here in Madison. And she just made it sound like it was like a Wild West free-for-all along the coast of Michigan with no governments and all these little towns that were popping up and then disappearing. And uh, where here in Madison, things were being done by government officials, essentially, right? In the mid-1800s. Do I have that right? Am I thinking about that right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how things went here. I would be shocked, shocked if there was any land profiteering in <laughs> Madison. Uh, so that Amy's talk was fantastic to me in the sense that it gave us a sense of how fluid or lack of government there could be at the time. So you're talking 1840s even pre-statehood into the 50s, 1850s, 1860s, and by when the 1870s, 1880s, the railroads were coming through, and I think that's where some of the ghost communities came in. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I'm just, just well, trying to, you know. No, that's fine. At the same time. Yes, and I, so I think that was one of the things for me. Now, it's a long time from Amy's time of the ghost cities, excuse me, ghost ports, to that 1910 piece on setting up the Municipal Reference Bureau. 
uh, that's two human generations. That's 60 years possibly from 1850 to, well, definitely it's 60 years from 1850 to 1910. Um, so we project back at our peril. We, we always think things are like they were, as they are now, that's how they were back then. And it's always hard not to do that. I did a high school local history project for a year and a half when I was in high school. That's why it was a high school project. Um, I was also working at Dixon Public Library at the time. And so I had really good access to all the stuff they had in their vault. And it still was like, holy cow, that's what they did then? Um, sometimes because that was the stuff that we still do now, and other times it's because I have no idea what they were talking about because we don't do it anymore. And I think figuring out how municipal government worked would be very intriguing. Other things. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to point out an example of such an early land speculator was uh, Governor Dodge, who was also a slaveholder as well. Um, I, I just wanted to raise the point, like I jested with you uh, er earlier this evening, the term land grab colleges has come up, particularly among uh, advocates for uh, Native Americans, because I guess they view the concept of uh, awarding these lands to universities as just another example of how uh, Native American lands were usurped. So land grant pro um, land grab project is um, I can't remember what uh, publication in the Great Plains that came is coming from. Uh, I think it's important to be aware like this land did not pop out of nowhere, and so when we talk about land grant, it also means land seized, or you can say transferred or whatever you would like, but I don't think people are selling their home for low dollars uh, without coercion. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind where we got our original wealth. The one thing that I, uh, there are some universities that were involved in selecting the lands because they came in to being later than this one did um, I don't know that we had any say in what lands the federal government gave in 1848. I'd be very interested in that. And uh, likewise, in 1862, 1866 in our case, um, these are lands that, to my understanding, the federal government had already taken title to. So it's, when you say a land grab university, it sounds like the university did it. Maybe in some cases they did. In other cases, it's like, well, the federal government's given us, do you still have an obligation because you're taking stolen goods? Let me check with my Jesuit trainers. Other folks? Uh, in the uh, realm of outreach, how much difficulty has there been in intellectual territoriality, like between the College of Life Science versus L&S versus engineering versus human ecology? How much territoriality has there been? Um, Man, in my experience, almost none. And uh, if I had experienced it, I would say so. Um, I like to, one of my bad jokes is to say that there are many silos at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and every one of them is full of silage. 
In other words, these are structures and you want to keep your stuff separated and it's not a bad thing. And otherwise, this place is remarkably synergistic. Um, 